Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 19, Greedy Omens. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and talented and beautiful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Well, thank you, honey. Hello, babe. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm doing good. So this was an easy week for the show because <laughs> things just sort things of... things just kind of happened. They just sort of rolled right out of the headlines this week. So this week in our Disney Detective, we're going to focus mainly on Disney's greed. <laughs> hey, um, this was all you. I, I, I wouldn't have it, done that. Well, it just kept jumping out at me. I know. The problem. I know. So we'll talk about a re-release of a popular Marvel movie. Uh, we'll talk about the random and hardly ever <laughs> happening Disney raising prices on they annual never prices. Do that. Never. <laughs> and then in our entertainment news, uh, we have a call for the removal of Good Omens, a show we actually like, mm-hmm. uh, from Netflix. Um, which it doesn't actually run on, but we'll get to that. Then we have um, uh, fashion icon and artist Gloria Vanderbilt's death. We have some some information on that. And then we will talk about uh, Robert Downey Jr. once again donning his alter ego as Tony Stark in uh, a great outreach that he did. We'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Uh, and some brief afterthoughts from there. So, mm-hmm. good show. Are we ready to get going? Sure, let's do it. Let's do it. Go for Disney Detective. So, this was actually something that popped up that you told me about, and then I heard about it after the fact, is that Avengers Endgame is going to be re-released. Big shocker. <laughs> Because, you know, it didn't make enough money Because it didn't make enough money. And in case you didn't already see it, you thought you were going to miss out and have to see it on DVD. No, you can actually go to the theaters and, and see it. But they are changing it a little bit. They are re-releasing it with some post-credit scenes. Yes, wow. So really not changing much of anything. So basically they announced at a recent Spider-Man Far From Home junket that Disney was putting Avengers Endgame back in theaters on June 28th. Um, The re-release will include some new post credit scenes, a tribute, and a few surprises. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. I don't know. know. Well, the interesting thing was they had talked about the the new Mm Spider-Man not really giving much away as to the direction the MCU is going. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the post credit scene that they threw in here... Was basically to help bridge that... Exactly. Bridge that gap. Oh, oh, it was that, and it was basically so they could make a few more dollars. Right, because basically it needs to make $45 more at the global box office before it can declare itself the highest grossing movie of all time, dethroning Avatar. Which, which was at two point seven eight eight billion. Which is also a Disney movie since they acquired the assets of twentieth century. Right, but at the time when, you know, Avatar made it, it wasn't a Disney movie. But so. the next three sequels of Avatar will be Disney movies. Right. And honestly I don't think the next three sequels are gonna make anywhere near <laughs> what well, and the I think, original. So I that, think a lot of people were puzzled why the original one made as much as it did. Right, exactly. And it wasn't that good of a movie. And that's the thing is the people that like were so into it 
were like so into it and saw it like 10 times, you know, in the theater where I think like Marvel and Star Wars fans like, all right, maybe you get a couple that see it twice in a theater yeah. or, you know, I know I have a couple of friends that they like to see it in IMAX right. and then they like to see it in regular, mm-hmm. you know, so I could see, okay, they're going twice, but there were people that were going to Avatar like double digit times because of the tails i guess i don't yeah. know i just didn't i didn't say which it, so. i i get a i get a laugh you go to animal disney's animal Kingdom, well that's what's so funny and that's the, you that's got the little joke. kids running around with the tails playing with them it's like you guys do realize they were sexual organs <laughs> right. in the movie right <laughs> right that was i remember a, a bunch of disney cast members uh friends of mine were posting that going yeah. Do you really, really want your kid wa- running around with that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we'll see how it does. You know, it, it's going to open, you know, a couple of days before Spider Man Far From Home opens on July 2nd. So maybe, you know, it's one of those you watch the one to kind of refresh what happens. Well, and I have maybe, to wonder is know? it going to steal some of the thunder of the new Spider Man movie? Yeah. Because remember. Disney doesn't own the rights to Spider-Man. It's a right, Sony it's collaboration. A Sony, so right. it's just kind of a slap in the face to Sony's cooperation with Disney with Spider-Man. Well, I think you have out. a lot of people who are interested in seeing Spider-Man. You know, obviously, once we saw the new trailer for it, you know, because the first trailers that you saw for it were before Endgame even came out. So you didn't really know what you know, this new Spider-Man was going to be like, you were kind of like, all right, here's another Spider-Man. And then obviously how Endgame ended. And then the new trailer that came out, you know, the second trailer that came out for Spider-Man made to go, okay, this is, this is going to be interesting. How, you know, how does everything play off after, you know, Endgame happens? Right. So, you know, so maybe, or you'll get the people that, oh, you know what, let me see it, you know, it's been a while since I saw it. I want to refresh myself and then go, you know, and, and see Spider-Man. So, you know, no, we'll see. It just strikes me as kind of lame that they're putting it back out there literally for the sole purpose mm-hmm. of scraping another $45 million. And it's not even because they're looking to get more profit. It's just so they can take the title. Mm-hmm. And you know what? It's going to happen. But And the worst part is it's just so childish. <laughs> it really is. But it's Disney, honey. Yeah, okay. This this is why Bob Iger is making $150-some million a year, because he makes decisions like this, I guess, right? I don't know. It prob- probably wasn't his decision. Let, let him pay the $45 million so he that can. they can. He can just one do, ticket yeah. for $45 million. <laughs> Hi, one ticket, please. That's yeah, $45 let million. Him buy the, <gasps> let him buy the golden ticket. <laughs> there you go. So should we go on to the next happy Disney story? Oh, one more story to bash Disney. I'm all for it. <laughs> and again, this was another one that I, I heard rumors about and then it obviously came out oh shocker walt disney world not you know any the whole corporation just walt disney world is hiking the annual pass price ahead of star wars land opening because they were so low to begin with and disney is so hurting for money right so on tuesday disney increased the prices on most annual passes as much as 150 dollars um, the price increases obviously come ahead of the August 28th opening of Disney World's Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So this is actually going to be the second price hike this year already, yeah. um, but the first for the annual passes. Now, the first uh, price hike that actually happened was actually um, based off of the daily park tickets. Um, So what they did was they started a surge pricing system. Basically what it is, is depending on the time of year, multi-day tickets would cost more during like the holiday seasons. So like Easter or Christmas, park tickets would be more than obviously during their quote unquote off season. So based on that logic, why didn't they lower the price tickets on the days that the park isn't as populated right. to get you would more think. people to go. You would think. Because Disney doesn't lower prices. Right. They That's never why. do that. And honestly, we've been there multiple times throughout, you know, various times of year. And there really is no slow season. Right. You know, there's always 
some, you know, massive group of of whatever down there. Yeah, granted, you might have, you know, days or weeks. Like right now, for some reason, happens to be a slow time. I'm not really sure because pretty much all the schools are out. You know, um, you know, all the kids are out of school right now. So you would think things would be right. picking up. But it's also a very hot time of year right now, too. So you have, you know, maybe that's why. And maybe because galaxy's edge isn't open yet people are like well i might as well just wait so and and that's a good point that's one of the things that irks me about this practice that disney has they're gonna because they spent all this money Mm -hmm. on galaxy's edge they're gonna hike ticket prices Mm -hmm. well the fact that they shut down literally half of the park right to do construction for three years they didn't lower the ticket prices right People who were paying for tickets to go to Hollywood mm-hmm. Studios were still paying full price right. for half the experience. Right, and we talked about that. Even now. Right. They're hiking prices now, and the entire area isn't even open. They still haven't opened the second ride, and yet they're hiking the prices mm-hmm. on it. Right, right. So just to give you an idea of the pricing. So they do uh, non-Florida resident prices and then Florida resident prices. So if you're a non-Florida resident, there's two different types of passes, the Platinum Plus and the regular Platinum. So the Platinum Plus is going to be going up 23%. That's ridiculous. The Platinum is going up 25%. Like, how do you justify that? I guess they do. Uh, What do you expect, to make all your money back in the first year? Uh, I don't know. 25% increase is insane. Oh, I know. So now for the Florida residents, there's a whole boatload. So they have the Platinum Plus. That's actually going up 18% versus the 23% for non-Florida residents. Oh, that's damn generous. That's nice of them, right? Um, Then there's the Platinum again, is 20% of an increase over the 25 that the non-Florida resident gets. Now, for non for Florida residents, they have smaller ones, which as DVC members, we were actually able to get um, the gold. Right. So basically what it is is for any of these others, there are certain blackout dates that you're not allowed. So like... Um, not Halloween, um, Christmas, right. um, New Year's, um, Easter, you know, so it, it, there's few and far between. Um, so for the gold annual passes, it's going up 15%. Then they have a silver pass, which has even more blackout dates. That's going up 8%. Then they have a weekday select pass, which is obviously just good Monday through Friday. And that's going up 9%. And then they also have an Epcot after four pass that's obviously just good for Epcot. And of course, Galaxy said you can't use it because it's right. Just... So how do you justify increasing it? Increasing it there? and that one's going to seven percent. Well, because there's new stuff coming into Epcot too, but of course it's not going to be, you know, within this year. But even that is going up. Seven percent overall. Yeah, I, I I think I've had my fill of Disney at this point in time. They just <laughs> they don't deserve my money at this point because right. they no, I get they it. have no respect for me as a consumer. You know they're they're nickel and diming you, mm-hmm. whether it's the parking or chipping their cups or doing away with the free refills for popcorn. I mean it's ridiculous the nickel and diming that they do at the parks. And they make more money than God. They have absolutely no mm-hmm. justification right. for trying to get that kind of money out of yeah, people. Yeah, it's it's really beco- it, it's becoming now more so that once in a lifetime trip. Yeah, you you know you save up for a couple of years, you do a nice Disney trip, and then you never do it again. Where it but used to be, this highlights even more the egregious pay that that someone like Bob mm-hmm. Iger is getting a hundred and fifty some million dollars. And they've got the gall to raise their annual ticket sales prices as much as 25%. Mm-hmm. It's insulting. Yeah. And the sad thing is there are people that will, you know, will still do it. And there are people that, you know, see the value in it. Unfortunately, there are some I'm not that, one of them. <laughs> there are some that are obviously starting to reconsider and, and, and contemplate not doing it again. And, and that's the thing about Galaxy's Edge is it's not... Star Wars, 
It's mm-hmm. Disney's version of Star Wars, right. which goes out of its way to basically erase anything from the Star Wars of my childhood. Right. So why do I want to support that? Right. You know, you're ruining a franchise that I've been a fan of for 40-some years now. I'm not going to give you money and encourage you to do that. Mm -hmm. No, and that's that's what you can do is not choose to go. And then, you know, there are obviously a whole lot more people that that are willing to go. They're welcome to take my place. In fact, you know, I'd be more than willing to give up my DVC and someone can buy me out of my DVC. Because I really don't even feel comfortable giving up dues for my DVC at this point. They just don't deserve it. Okay, that's enough bashing at Disney. Okay, you done? Thanks, I'm glad I had to get that out of my system. <laughs> okay. Okay. On to our regular entertainment our, news. Our regularly scheduled entertainment <laughs> news. This rant brought to you by... <laughs> Disney. <laughs> So the first thing we have in our entertainment news is some uh, <laughs> protests, a petition to have Good Omens removed from uh, a streaming network that it doesn't even appear on. Yeah, that that's the kick in the pants. So, so why don't you lead this story in? Sure. So more than 20,000 Christians asked the wrong streaming service to remove the show Good Omens. So there was a petition started by a Christian organization calling for the removal of the show Good Omens, and it totally missed the mark. Uh, It was signed by more than, as I said, 20,000 people, and it called for Netflix to pull the fantasy series from its platform. Just one problem. Netflix doesn't offer the show. It's on (laughs) Amazon Prime. Dun, dun, dun. So um, the petition basically said, this series represents devils and Satanists as normal and even good, where they merely have a different way of being and mocks God's wisdom. Um, So, and some of the petitioners' qualms included the fact that God is voiced by a woman. Oh my (gasps) goodness. (laughs) The Antichrist is portrayed as a normal kid, and the four riders of the apocalypse are portrayed as a group of bikers yeah okay (laughs) so (laughs) yeah so basically it was please sign our petition telling netflix that we will not stand silent as they destroy the barriers of horror we have that we uh still have for evil and the the petition you know stopped loading on their uh the christian return to order website on thursday um, cause that was when they kind of realized, whoops, <laughs> they were sending it to the wrong place. Um, so if you don't know the story of Good Omens, um, Good Omens follows, um, an angel, um, a Xerophel and a demon Crowley, um, as they attempt to save the world from the apocalypse, um, by coming, um, the apocalypse from starting because there is the antichrist who, once he turns 11, he's going to take his rightful place. So basically they're doing all these different things to stop it from happening. It's actually based off of a 1990 fantasy novel of the same name. And the miniseries just debuted last month. Um, the co-author of the book, um, took the petition in stride and actually posted on Twitter saying, I love that they're going to write to Netflix and try and get good omens canceled. Um, it's a, it, it's, uh, says it's, it is all really, um, it, it all, um, I can't says it all really. says it all really. Woo. Um, and it was funny because they they showed like a picture of the script um, on the on the tweet with like all the writing and saying, you know, like uh, where it says something about them being good friends. The, the two, the angel and the demon being good friends. No, they're really in love. And he just kind of laughed because you're sending it to the wrong. Right. The wrong place. So that that was kind of funny. Well, and I think. You know, this deserves about as much mockery as I can muster at this point in time. (laughs) Because, again, it shows bigoted Christians Mm -hmm. who clearly are chauvinistic Mm because they can't comprehend the possibility that a woman, God, could actually be portrayed as a a woman. Right, right. Never minding the fact that if you go back to ancient times, you had incredibly powerful female gods in the Greek Mm -hmm. and Roman and other cultures. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's not like it's a new idea. Right, right. Um, 
And, you know, the fact that it's a biblical prophecy that they're making fun of, the pro- the, mm-hmm. the um, apocalypse prophecy that's in the Bible. Right. Which the writers here didn't write, right. just for the record. <laughs> I hate to spoil the ending, but, you know, that's been around a lot longer. Right, right. Um, and it's an interesting, the show itself is an interesting take because... It's good and evil working together, right. hand in hand, to stop the destruction of the planet. Right. God forbid we actually do that, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> and what's funny is how you have the different angels who are like, no, no, we can let it happen because we know we're going to win the war. Right. And you have, you know, all the demons who are like, come on, let it happen. We're, you know, and you have these two who don't want it to happen because they don't want to see the end of the world and all these people dying and and everything happening. And, it, you know, the, the four horsemen, you know, it's kind of interesting how they're portrayed as well. You know, like Famine, you know, he was basically, you know, it's a, it was kind of, uh, almost seen as a um, like a corporate the plant based food you know right, it's right. food but it's it, it wasn't plant based I can't remember what they called it it was like it's nothing based and right. you know this is there's you no know, food whatsoever there's basically no food you're going to eat all this but you're still going to be hungry because right. you know and so it was an interesting you know take on that and then the pollution you know yeah you don't have pestilence as one of the four horsemen anymore it's pollution now it's pollution and you so see it's a, it's a commentary r- on on our society our society yeah. yeah so you look at it and go yeah and if you the have four these, horsemen were supposed if they were to show up today this is what they would and you have they these would really whack job like christian fundamentalists here mm-hmm. who can't get over themselves enough mm-hmm. to realize that the message of the show is actually one that promotes peace, mm-hmm. promotes environmentalism, mm-hmm. promotes you know loving and forgiveness and, mm-hmm. and peace and people getting along. Right. It's like, okay, if you're Christian, what values do you portray at that point if you're right. against all of these? Right, exactly. It, it's just, and, and you know, the co-author says, yeah, it, it says it all really, the fact that they Clearly, don't watch the show, right? Because they don't even because they don't even know what service no, the stream. Nobody on. Googled it to see where so, exactly it was. You know, it's one of these things where someone said something to them, and all of and a sudden, and they got bent out of shape. It was and, yeah, it was their turn to be offended, right? And before even let's watching, start a petition, right? Before even watching a, an episode of it, and you know. you know, if nothing else, this is another example of just what's wrong with our society mm-hmm. is. Everybody's entitled to be offended by something, and I'm going to get my 15 minutes of fame now, yeah, even yeah. though I made an ass out of myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yes, mock them all. Mm-hmm. Anyway, next. <laughs> um, so on Monday morning, Gloria Vanderbilt, fashion icon and artist, died at age 95. Um, Her son, Anderson Cooper, actually was the one to kind of report it. Um, It's funny. I've I've known the story of Gloria Vanderbilt. I think most people our generation, younger, know her for her genes. That was really, you know, where she kind of took off for the most part. And that was in, you know, the 70s and, and 80s. But really, her story goes obviously much beyond that you know um there were many books written about her um many different documentaries and and things um she was known as the poor little uh rich girl um her father actually died when she was a baby um and that's where you know she she inherited you know her money from then there was a a custody battle between her mother and her um her aunt aunt, and her aunt actually won the custody battle and the um woman who basically her her nanny um the the aunt basically fired so any semblance of you know her normal childhood you know was kind of ripped away from her um you know was moved all around you know didn't really like being in the public eye but because of her name and and everything you know she always had it follow her um so you know as soon as she was old enough you know she was 17 when she first got married um basically you know kind of found the first person married him basically to kind of get away from from her aunt and then when she turned 21 was when she was able to get 
start getting her trust money. She divorced the one husband and married, you know, the next husband, had two kids with him, then, you know, basically kind of started her art career, um, divorced the second husband, married the third, and kind of got involved in a little bit of acting. Um, she did a couple of, of parts in, in movies and stuff, then divorced the third husband, married the fourth husband, and had two kids, and that's actually where Anderson Cooper um, right. You know, it, it's funny. Not a lot of people, when they hear Anderson Cooper and Gloria Vanderbilt, until what? I read the article myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was also interesting was that her her logo for her jeans, which was a swan, actually was based off of her first movie part. Um, oh, I didn't so know that, that was okay. kind of the little link that she always had, and it was one of those things that she kind of fell into the fashion stuff, and that was really where the majority of the people, you know, knew her from. You know, unless you knew about the stuff from the Great Depression and right, and right. whatnot, and you know, she she you know had a, a very public life, but she also you know had that she very, very she was a very private very person private person you know yeah. as well. Um, her fourth husband unfortunately passed away um, on an operating table. She never remarried. Um, and then her her son from that husband, her oldest son Cooper's um, older brother, he had actually committed suicide um, at a young age as well. So really, it became Anderson and and her like they right. they were very close. Um, CNN actually played you know uh, an obituary, a video obituary, and I believe there had been a documentary on HBO that most of the scenes had had come from, um, and Anderson you know added to it, um, and he showed you know she she had she ended up being diagnosed with stomach cancer, and it was basically you know by the time they diagnosed it, was so it, advanced it was so advanced she didn't have much time and it was so sweet because he showed a video of her in the hospital and you would have never recognized her you know no makeup you know whatever and he said for the first time he realized his laugh and his he knew where he finally knew where he got his laugh from it was his mother's laugh uh -huh. and it's a video of her just laughing and he's laughing too and it's the same you know laugh and it was just it was sweet it was very sweet and and um just kind of touching to you know that she was such an icon and again a lot of people probably didn't even know you know half of what she had yeah. gone through um but she lived a, a very full life and you know always loved um you know being in love and you know anderson had said you know she trusted too freely and too completely and suffered tremendous losses but she always pressed on and always worked hard and always believed the best was yet to come yeah she's uh an incredible inspiring story mm -hmm. um especially you know from a female empowerment standpoint mm -hmm. like oh yeah you know yeah she came from a privileged background mm -hmm. But it wasn't that privileged background that made her who she was. Right, right. Uh, there was a separate article that I had read where Anderson Cooper said, you know, there's not going to be an inheritance from her. She didn't believe in it. Even though right. she was a recipient of it mm -hmm. herself, she did not believe in it. Mm -hmm. And she didn't believe in it because she was afraid that had her children thought that there was going to be an inheritance or a trust fund, there would have been nothing to inspire them to, to, to greatness, do they, to do yeah. what they did. Mm -hmm. And and Cooper actually thanked her for that because mm -hmm. he said, had I known that I could just sit back and wait for the money to flow in, I would have never done what I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, he credited his mother with so much of his success. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people might think that's kind of a, a, a cold approach to things. Um, but... It was effective. Right. And you figure, you know, everything that she went through in her life, you know, and all the people that were nice to her or did things were, you know, because they knew she was uh, going to get a trust fund and right. she was going to come into money. And it was like, yeah, oh, you, well, you, let's, you, you know, pay attention to the, the cash cow and, yep. you know, wait for, you know, her to come of age to be able to, to take advantage. So, yeah. So well, unfortunate to see her passing. Yeah. So, one more entertainment article. What do we have now? So, this was one that you told me about, which I, I kind of laughed because... 
I was like, really? And it just seems, as, as you mentioned in, in our opening, that Robert Downey Jr. is just becoming more and more like Tony Stark every day. Yeah. Um, so last a couple of weeks ago, we had mentioned that he was starting this this coalition um, to, you know, get you know, people more involved in the environment and doing all this, you know, nanotechnology and all, all these other different things. Um, so there was a story out of North Carolina where a teenager uh, lost her leg in a shark attack. Um, and basically the, the father had, I guess, tweeted out or, or sent something to Instagram saying, hey, you know, sent it to um, Robert Downey Jr. saying, hey, my daughter is a huge fan. You know, it'd be awesome if you could start following her right. on Instagram. Well, he decided to take it one step further and he actually uploaded a video addressed to her. And we're going to play it for you. Miss Winter, is that you? Hi. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. This is a heroic story of resilience, I gotta tell you. And you're not alone, uh, but not just because of folks who've had similar stuff happen, but also because of your interest in uh, sustainability and preservation of our oceans and marine life and all that stuff. I'm a fan, I gotta tell you. Uh, and of course, yes, I will follow you on Instagram. All right, let's get that out of the way. But also, Kind of like uh, Tony with Peter Parker a few years back. I'm in a bit of a recruitment mode. So I want to see if you would join my footprint coalition and be my North Carolina ambassador. Take your time. Yes, no, maybe. Great. So I'm pretty sure she said yes. How, how could you? <laughs> exactly. How exactly. could you not? You um, were just recruited by Tony Stark. <laughs> awesome is that you know and and the biggest thing was that you know she's very much a, a supporter of animal rights and shark conservation and she had been promoting the hashtag sharks are still good people even after getting the shark you know being attacked by a shark she basically you know didn't feel like it was the shark's fault right you know and here you have this horrific thing happen and, you know, your dad <laughs> sends a message to Robert Downey Jr. saying, please follow her on Instagram. She's probably your biggest fan. And then all of a sudden he comes out and sends a video message and, hey, I'm going to recruit you to lead my coalition That's in cool. North Carolina. So your Iron Man's ambassador. <sighs> yeah. That's and, pretty cool. And you know what? It's, it's nice to, you know, see that he's still living that yeah. you know it's it's not like oh i'm done i don't need to be that anymore you know and as, as we've talked about him you know countless times before you know with the children's hospital and and you yeah. know the kids with the the limbs and and stuff and and all the different things like that it, it you know i think he appreciates who he's become too knowing that he had such a checkered past sure. when he, you know, was younger and starting out in Hollywood and, you know, all the times in rehab and basically, you know, so many people giving up on him and, you know, thinking you know, he was funny. done. It's, it's almost like a born again Christian. Like <laughs> getting very of, religious on us well, now. Instead of finding God and changing his life. He Robert found, Downey Jr. found, found Iron Man, and it changed Tony his Stark. life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it it that served as that inspiration mm -hmm. to him. Yeah, and and you know, it doesn't really matter where the you get your Iron motivation Man. from. Yeah. It doesn't matter what motivates you, as long as you're motivated to change the world. And and I think it's a fantastic thing. Yeah, yeah. So kudos to him again. Very cool. So insightful picks. Insightful picks. Here we go. And you, my dear. So I probably don't have to tell a whole lot about my insightful pick because I'm guessing if you paid paid attention, <laughs> I, uh, you might know what I'm, I'm going to pick. So this week's insightful pick for me is a show that's not on Netflix. Not a Netflix show. So don't write to Netflix and complain about it. If you're going to complain, it's Amazon Prime. <laughs> 
and it's the show Good Omens. Um, so it's a fantasy series where we see Fussy Angel Azir- Aziraphale and his loose living demon Crowley team up for an unlikely duo. The two have become overly fond of life on Earth, and now they're forced to make an alliance in an attempt to stop the approaching Armageddon. Um, to do that, they have to find the missing Antichrist, an 11-year-old boy who is unaware that he is even meant to bring the end of days upon humanity. Um, has a great cast, uh, Michael Sheehan, David Tennant from Doctor Who, uh, John Hamm from um, Mad Men, um, our star in the series, which is based on a book of the same name. Um, and again, as mentioned, the show's on Amazon Prime, not Netflix, and it's actually only six episodes. And I think we're on episode five, I believe. I believe so, yeah. Um, so we're actually almost done with it. We're almost to the end of the world. We're almost to the end of the world. It's It was definitely, it's done a lot different than most of your typical shows. It does a lot of back and forth. Uh, not time traveling, but... Um, a lot of backstory telling. Backstory telling. You know, it kind of starts out in the here and now. Then it goes back 11 years. Then it even goes back to the Garden of Eden. And then kind of, you know, one episode was basically just kind of taking you from the beginning of time until now and basically seeing what this relationship between the you know this angel and this demon you know how it's cultivated right. you know throughout time and 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 whatnot i think i think it took us maybe two episodes to kind of really get into it just because we didn't know what we were signed up for you know and it's kind of an off the wall plot the dialogue some of the dialogue's difficult Right. It's a very Britishy kind of yes, show. Yes, yes. It definitely, even though there so, are some very American aspects to it and American actors in it, the main characters, you know, are British or Scottish. Um, and, you know, so they do have that, that thick accent. So you're like, well, what do you say? And the humor <laughs> is a very dry British Yes, it's a British very humor. dry, yeah. So if you're a fan of that type of humor, then you'll definitely... You know, you'll definitely, you know, go along with it and, and just, you know, you have the, the witch finder and you have the witch. And then, you know, this last episode, you know, there were aliens that showed up and you're like, what? Yeah, How'd yeah. that happen? You know, it was just like it, you know, there were some aspects when we were when we were watching it that kind of reminded us of like a goofy um, Twilight Zone episode. Right. You know, because right. like it's Monty Python or, or a Monty Python, you know flair to it so but it's you know it's it's based on a book and it's it's written by neil gaiman mm-hmm. so it has a very neil gaiman feel to mm-hmm. it uh, if you ever read any of his works yeah so um, it's it's definitely you know i'm looking forward to it and kind of upset that it's only six episodes when i realized that and like oh we're almost done yeah well That's you so know sad. you destroy the world you really don't have a sequel to come back have, to right there's no second season to. yeah i guess not so, <laughs> good pick though good thanks pick. Almost immediately after the successful and triumphant Apollo 11 moon landing nearly 50 years ago, there were skeptics who refused to accept that humankind could accomplish such an enormous undertaking, Science Channel representatives said in a statement. Astonishingly, some of those doubts persist today despite the enormous scientific progress that has been made since then. My pick of the week this week is Truth Behind the Moon Landing, a six-part, uh, six-episode series which premiered on June 2nd on the Science Channel. It'll air Sundays through June and July. It will focus on several space-related conspiracy claims, among them whether we actually landed on the moon 50 years ago on July 20th, 1969. Uh, former astronaut Leland Melvin joins a group tackling conspiracy theories about the moon landing. Uh, Melvin co-hosts the show with two others, an Iraq war veteran and former FBI agent Chad Jenkins and the best-selling author Mike Barra. They uncover evidence and apply the scientific method to several conspiracies. The trio will discuss topics such as the fatal Apollo 1 fire in 1967, 
a lunar lander prototype that Neil Armstrong, the first person to walk on the moon, used for training, and the capabilities of Hollywood's visual effects in the late 1960s. Hmm. What's interesting about this show is um, Mike Barra, who's the best-selling author and co-host of the show, is a conspiracy theorist, okay. and he presents the perspective of the conspiracy folks out there. And what they do is they take these various conspiracy theories that he puts forth and they test them. And they'll, you know, one of them was uh, about the Apollo 1 uh, fire. And they went into a lab and they recreated in the lab the conditions under which that fire occurred okay. to see if the description they could and that NASA gave for the fire, mm -hmm. you know, with a coolant leaking on the exposed wires, 100% uh, oxygen environment, and the, the Velcro and other material in there, if it could have caused this. And, you know, they, so far, they've proved every one of these theories as bogus. Mm. So everything from, um, everyone may have, many people have seen um, the, the footage of uh, Neil Armstrong as he's flying what they affectionately termed the flying bedstead. It was a prototype lunar lander okay. that had the same controls as the lunar excursion module that they would have landed on the moon with. And it used a jet engine on uh, a gimbal to simulate the weightless, the the G, the gravity of the moon. Okay. So that you could simulate maneuvering and so forth. And there was very famous footage of him flying at one point in time. He loses control, dramatically ejects from the craft, and the craft crashes and is destroyed. Mm -hmm. Well, they the theory was, oh, well, if you couldn't control that here, there's no way you could no have landed you on, the it on the moon. No way you could do it on the moon. Well, so they actually the go to JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and they investigate this. They talk to uh, an engineer that actually worked on it, Okay. They bring out one of the two prototypes that they had. So they have a surviving one okay. of these that you would think would be in a museum somewhere. Right. Not like, hey, we got it in the garage. It's, Hold on. Let me it's go in a hangar. It. Yeah. And they wheel <laughs> this thing out. And um, uh, Leland Melvin climbs up inside this thing. And he's hands on with the controls and everything on this thing. I mean, it's that realistic. Right. The right. investigation. And they talk to the engineer. And the engineer says, well, it was human error. And of course, they dramatically dun, oh, dun, dun. They cut the commercial and they dramatically suggested, oh, Neil Armstrong didn't fly this right. And he comes back and it turns out there was no instrumentation. So he couldn't see fuel, fuel, fuel or anything like that. Turns out some guy on the ground was supposed to be monitoring the fuel, got distracted, and he ran out of fuel. And that's why it crashed. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and even though that's the only he, footage some other guy was texting while he was driving right that's what it was the original texter and driving <laughs> even though that's the only footage that people ever see is him crashing turns out he had over 20 successful flights and the thing worked flawlessly it was just the one time but it never surfaced right. so um mike barra who is the conspiracy theorist is open-minded enough to hear this information and accept this as, okay, well, it makes sense, you know? And they explain, here's why the conspiracy theory came out, because this information never got out. Mm. Um, and it turns out a lot of that information, had it been released, would have immediately put to bed a lot of these conspiracies. Right. So the thing that I like about the show is it's all fact-based. They use a scientific method to go out and prove why these theories, these conspiracy theories are wrong. And it's less about justifying the fact that the moon landing occurred. You know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this show proves that it has. Mm -hmm. It's more of a behind the scenes look and a tribute to the Apollo program itself. Mm -hmm. And it gives you almost a hands-on feel for it. You know, they, they, they bring engineers out and scientists out who worked on the Apollo program. Wow. Who, you know, these guys are getting up there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. these are the unsung heroes mm -hmm. of the, NASA right. who never got, you know, they weren't the guys in front of the cameras like the astronauts. These were the guys in the back right. that were making all this happen. Mm -hmm. 
And the great thing is, is you have someone, an astronaut, a former astronaut in Melvin, who was up in space twice on the space shuttle. He's kind of, he's seen as a hero, even to these engineers. Mm -hmm. And he's showing up, talking to these guys and thanking them for doing what they did that allowed him to, the honor to do what he did. Right, right. And it's a very touching closing the circle type mm. thing. And it's a great behind the scenes look at some of the stuff that just never sees the light of day because, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's not the, the super critical, really interesting, uh, headline grabbing stuff that you would normally see. Right. But it's the stuff that was critical for this program for to work. Yeah. Well, and I think that's also something just in terms of when you look at how, popular and how just uh, um you know attention grabbing the whole apollo missions were you had pe you know kids that stayed home you know schools that 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 you know weren't open and you had you know all these viewing parties and people yeah. you know sitting you know by a tv you know one tv and and a whole neighborhood sitting and watching or listening to a radio and and people stopping and and, you know, as as a country, as as the world, we were all so enthralled yeah. and we, you know, did they make it, you know, and just for like the simplest thing that now it's like, oh, yeah. there and back, it was a big deal back then, you know. And even now, unfortunately, with, you know, a lot of the, the space shuttle, you know, takeoffs and landing, you know, some people didn't even know that it was happening. It wasn't yeah. as televised. It wasn't as as... You know, because it became so routine. Right, it became so that routine. Even, even the Apollo program fell to that. Right, there was such the end. low viewership right. during the Apollo 13 mission that nobody even knew what was going on right. until, until it became a tragedy. Right, and that's when everybody, you know, started, you know, watching it again and, right. you know, praying and doing whatever to, you know. So it, it's interesting that, you know, there's, you know, there's still that love, yeah. you know, there and that, you know, these, these, you know, shuttle astronauts who really, again, get, you know, a lot more fame and glory are appreciating, yeah. you know, and that, to where me, they came from. To me, I think that's the biggest takeaway. It's like the conspiracy theory is just a, right. a driver to do these things. But it's great to see these engineers and these, these, these guys who were such a crucial part finally get mm -hmm. some of the spotlight and get the... Right. Get, Get the appreciation they well, and that's appreciation like, they deserve, and that's even like the the movie Hidden Figures. Exactly, you know, here's you know a group of women who, if they weren't around, we wouldn't have gotten based on a true story. You know where yeah. where we were. You know, so how many years did it take? And you, you know, know it's for funny. I don't want to get. I don't want to politicize it, but <laughs> you know, you see the "Make America Great" slogan mm -hmm. all over the place. And there's no substance to it. Right. You know, when was America great? When do you want to, where, where are you referring to? Right. And, and this time, mm -hmm. you know, despite the rampant discrimination and mm -hmm. segregation, um, this was when America was great. When, when the entire world looked to Came us. Came together and, yeah. and. And we were the leaders and, mm -hmm. and we were able to put aside these petty differences of race and, and, you know, sexism and stuff like that to accomplish this common goal of putting mm -hmm. this impossible goal, really. Right. Which is where these conspiracies come mm -hmm. from is that yeah. it was so inconceivable that we would put people on the moon that these conspiracy theories had to be born. Right. Right. And as. As one people, we were able to overcome it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that's when America was great, and mm -hmm. that's what we should be focusing on. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, truth behind the moon landing on Science Channel on Sundays. Uh, check your local listings. Good pick. And we will come back with our afterthoughts. And to you, my dear. So this one with that was one that actually just popped up because last weekend, as we had mentioned, uh, was uh, Philadelphia Wizard World, um, which is an annual convention uh, that that's held in Philadelphia in other locations as well. Um, and we did not attend it because it's, you know, unfortunately priced out for us for, for what we go 
for it. Uh, I did have a coworker who went and he said it was okay. You know, it wasn't, wasn't horrible. You know, like if he had to do it again, he probably wouldn't have just again because of how much it cost and, you know, really what they did for, you know, the money. Um, but something that was kind of funny that popped up that I didn't even know about, and obviously it's been happening for a couple of years, is another Comic Con in the Philadelphia area called Keystone Comic Con. Um, it's a it's a little bit smaller. It's actually st- uh, going to be at the um, Pennsylvania Convention Center, so the same location that Philadelphia Comic Con or um, Wizards is, is done. Um, it's going to be the end of August. It's August 23rd through 25th. Um, tickets actually aren't that bad. They're like $35, $15 for kids. Um, it, they, they're they still announcing celebrities that are there. So if you're the type of person that that is into the celebrities, um, you know, the, every couple of days it seems they're uh, introducing new ones. Um, they have three people from three different Star Treks that are going to be there. Uh, Nichelle Nichols, uh, Michael Dorn, and um, Marita Stardis. Um, so I'm sure there's going to be some sort of Star Wars panel that'll be there. Uh, cool. There's some Harry Potter um celebrities there oh, our you know girl, love that <laughs> we just won't tell her <laughs> um you know and then of course the voice actors you know as well um but from you know different reviews that i saw you know people posting about it they said it was a very organized it was one of their favorite ones because you know it, it almost sounds like it might be like the um Pen- the Pennsylvania Comic, the, Greater Philadelphia. the Greater Philadelphia Comic Con that we went to, that we really enjoyed. It was it was a decent size. You didn't feel overwhelmed, um, and actually had some some panels. So I don't think they've cool. announced any of the panels yet because it's still a, a little far out. And I'm guessing they're probably going to announce um, some more celebrities, you know, before before it gets closer. But if you're interested, uh, the website is KeystoneComicCon.com. So again, if you're in the Philadelphia area and you know you're interested check it out awesome we'll have to take some uh, pictures of the footage and bring it back for the show yep absolutely awesome I think that does it for us uh, today I think it does uh, another great podcast and uh, we'll be back next week with another one mm-hmm we sure will uh, well I did want to have one programming note though uh, last week I wanted to apologize we had some technical difficulties. Uh, posting our um, podcast up to our sites. We typically record over the weekends and we'll post out on uh, Monday mornings at 8. We had some issues getting this stuff out. We had some problems with our upstream bandwidth here, which also complicated uh, the actual streaming of it on Twitch, our Twitch channel on Sunday night. I apologize for that and uh, hopefully we won't have that issue this week. Fingers crossed. Yep, that's all I got. All right, we're out. See you next week. Have a good one, guys. Take care.